Clark. There's $10,000 for the winner. Cone way out in front, but Garrett's not gonna let him take it that easy. Who wants this more, Cone or Driller? Watch Driller, he is scrapping. He is trying to straighten it out as best he can. Cone smoothly coming down to the bottom, but look at Driller, it's still alive, it's Cone! Robert Cone is the winner of the inaugural Pepe Grom Summer Cup. In first place, from Killington, Vermont, Robert Cohn, how about a big round of applause for Robert? I'm feeling good with my ski racing. There's only been one race. I did I did win it, so that I am at the top of the standings, but I want to keep it there. I, I had a strong race that I won at the end of last season, and I just want to keep it rolling through these, so hopefully that'll be the case, and I just want to do the best I can for tomorrow. Just starting the athlete meeting, or about to start it up. Um, we're all going to discuss all the schedule changes if we have any, and uh, make sure everything's going to run smoothly tomorrow. I'm a little uh, sore from all the powder skiing and recreational skiing I've done this last week with the family, but uh, I'm feeling confident. I like this hill, so going to rip it up. I've spent the last two two weeks here on the hill and skied some days. I'm exciting. It's for sure it's going to be a hard fight and a lot of fun. So uh, the course can be really interesting. There's a lot of terrain, it's really steep, and there's a lot of like side hill aspects of the course. So it's gonna be a real test of everyone's endurance and athletic capabilities. I have been training on the FIS and NORAM circuit since the last race, so I haven't skied any dual slalom since then, but uh, I feel good and I feel ready to attack tomorrow. I want to thank you all for coming out and racing. We've got a full field for the first time of this year. And I just saw Billy Kidd walk in. Billy Kidd was a World Pro Champion in 1970. Well, I just want to say welcome, everybody. I just drove up from home. Did you, did you all bring your shovels? Yeah. <laughs> the snow is going to be up to your chin tomorrow. As John said, just a few short decades ago, five, um, Moose and I raced on the pro circuit. We raced in the Olympics just before that. Moose, I am so happy. This is the Moose Barrows Cup. Moose is one of the legends of Steamboat. Well, basically, I just wanted to say a quick hello, welcome, and have a great race. Good luck. Oh, and Happy New Year. Allison's a steep hill, um, but we definitely got a lot of snow coming in overnight. So we're gonna have to show up pretty early tomorrow morning, slide off all the snow we can, make it safe for all the athletes, but it's gonna be a little challenging. Uh, the weather stays as it is, it's gonna be low visibility as well, and it'll be a fun race at least uh, to watch. So get excited. If you think a tin shed can hold up like a tough shed, you're in for a big surprise. After 38 years, our buildings speak for themselves. Dream, design, and build at toughshed.com. Springs, uh, second stop of the World Pro Ski Tour. I'm out here today just kind of doing some soul shredding. Uh, luckily, I got some really close family friends who have a place here. I grew up skiing here with them, and uh, we've been out for the last two days just ripping around, doing doing, uh, doing laps on the morning side on the backside, hitting all the shoots. We got both qualification and 
the elimination round in one day, which is the first time that we've done that. I think it's gonna be awesome because you just bang it out one day and then also because Halston has like this awesome setup, it's gonna be a night race. And I always think that night races are better than day races. Number one reason for sure is spectators. Like you get everyone down in Steamboat to come out. I'm pretty pumped. I think it's gonna be a great, great event. No, so Buddy, Buddy Warner was on the, uh, the US ski team, I think in the 70s, and he's like a multi-time uh, Olympian. But we're gonna go down Buddy's run, and it's like his favorite run where he did like all of his training for the Olympics. And uh, I don't know how that started, but you got the little, uh, what do you call that? The bust of, uh, of Buddy over there. And ever since we were young, it was always, they didn't have that sign when we were growing up coming here. It was always, that buddy for good luck. Bang, bang. This is uh, perfected by Didier Kouche, a Swiss guy. You come in, you're like, watch this move, baby. Let's go. I grew up skiing at Buck Hill, Minnesota. It's a really cool old family run resort. And we had a really great group of guys there, probably seven or eight of us who were just pushing each other. You're kind of a product of your environment. And so they were pushing me, I was pushing them. And a lot of them ended up skiing D1 in college. And then I was able to make it on the US ski team. During the 90s, snowboarding was like kind of rock and roll rebel. like. Yeah, I definitely want to do that. And my mom was like, all right, you, you can snowboard, but you have to finish ski school first. And so from there, I just kind of fell in love with the sport and had that same friend group. And we all moved up together to club team. And then we moved to Buck Hill. And from there, it was just kind of natural for me. It was, uh, I, I took to it pretty quickly and started competing internationally when I was, I think, 13 years old. And, was ranked first in the world for slalom for four years from when I was 16 to 20 and made the US ski team my senior year of high school and traveled around with them for seven years. I think my best season was 2014, 2015. I had actually just been let go from the US ski team and I was sitting there and I was like, oh man, is this it? Like, really? Am I about to like be done ski racing? And then I decided, no, I, th I, I think I have more to give to the sport and joined a private team, Team America who now I'm going against Alex Lever on Team America in about 45 minutes, so we'll see. <laughs> but, um, but no, yeah, that year we have this awesome coach, Peter Lang, who would really just kind of get confidence, instill confidence in you and, and, and just say, hey, don't sweat the little stuff, you know? His line is always, the sport is hard enough on you, you don't need to be hard on yourself. And so that season just kind of like really took ownership of my own skiing, was able to win the slalom title and the overall title for the North American Cup, which then secured me World Cup spots in every race for the next year. I requalified for the US team and ended up scoring three times in World Cups, getting three second runs. After that, got a little injured and then kind of went back and forth between continuing to ski and stopping and then just last spring retired. But stayed with the sport, stayed with the Pro Tour, which I love, and then coached the Dartmouth ski team last year as I finished up school. Uh, warming up the starts. Uh, trying to get the timing for, for the beeps and for the lights. Um, I think it's better to use the lights because second run when it's a differential, having two beeps gets uh, pretty confusing. But other than that, we're just hot dog and trying to uh, psych everyone out, especially these newbie uh, steamboat youngsters. Yeah, you guys, no chance. Oh, I think it's just because he's nervous. <laughs> 
He's just mad there's another tall guy in the group. He's gonna look back. I know, seriously. Yeah. You're gonna be blocking these gates so easily. If you've ever, have you ever, oh, you've but, never done that? You oh, wow. The power. Oh, fuck, man. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> gonna be interesting there's a bunch of following gates uh, I think the red course might be a little faster but you got to run them both so hard charge both runs but we got some kicker jumps tighter turns more swing should be a pretty rough and rowdy day Just keeping it safe for the kids out here making sure we're all happy, having fun, and uh, it'll be a good day. I think it's pretty good. It's, it's quite different than Vail. The start is a lot steeper. So the timing out of the gate is going to be important, but pushing afterwards is not crazy. Um, it's not going to like win or lose the race today because you just pick up speed super early. So then we got this nice fall away here. Um, so you're going to be battling all those angles of the hill and it'll, it'll be pulling you this way, but you, we need to go that way. So just got to come in with some some smart tactics here. Can't can't go blackout rage yet. That's for the bottom. Pro Tour is the only tour that I'm doing this year. I'm working full time in New York at this investment bank and it's been different. It's, uh, you know, you can take a lot of skills that you learn from skiing, hard work, dedication, and transfer it over into the professional world in that regard as well. But just not having as much time on snow, my training prep period was essentially non-existent. So you're having to rely a lot on muscle memory. And then there's the fitness aspect of it too. Skiing is like so brutal on your body. You know, when I was on the US team, we were spending six hours in the gym and now I'm like lucky if I get 45 minutes in a day. So that's kind of been a struggle, but it really makes me appreciate skiing more every turn. I'm like, oh man, this is really fun. So it's really kind of re-instilled the love of the sport that I had when I was younger, the, the joy of the boy, so to speak. And so it's been a little difficult because I am such a competitive person coming back to these races and losing to some of these guys that I didn't in the years past. But what are you gonna do? Just come out, give it your all, have fun. I wanna go through. Go through what? Oh, yeah. We can Those puppies. Are we, are we going through? Uh, go right here. Right here? Doors open. Doors open? I'm definitely staying involved with the Pro Tour just because I love it. It's a little less stressful than the World Cup circuit just because it's like, oh, if I don't do well at this race, then I might not qualify for this race, which is a qualifier for the Olympics, which then I won't make the team next year. And there were a lot of anxieties associated with that. The Pro Tour, it just kind of takes all of that off the table, just takes out some of the variables so you can really just focus on the skiing. For this season, I'm really hoping to make it to the round four. Last week in Vail, I got knocked out in the round of eight to Garrett Driller, who ended up getting second. So my goal is to make it to a round of four, if I can, and then also just to make it to all the events. It has been a little tough to take some time off from the office, you know. I'm up there taking calls and responding to emails, and so hopefully they'll uh, continue to allow me to sneak away for a Friday or two going forward. I'd love to just stay Stay involved with the tour and see it thrive and see it grow.
Olympic and World Championship medalist Ted Ligeti will be racing tonight here on Hollison Hill for the Moose Barrows Trophy. Ted is one of the best giant slalom racers in skiing history with two Olympic gold medals, five World Championship gold medals, and five World Cup giant slalom titles. We're lucky enough to have Ted Ligeti here racing against us. He is in and out of Europe right now. He was fourth in the first World Cup uh, GS race. Ted's always been really good about interacting with us when we were on the team, when I was young and coming up. We could ask him questions, no problem, and he'd be like, oh yeah, this is how I approach the course, you know, or this is, this is how I set up my skis, versus there are some other superstars who are like a bit more of a recluse, and so they'll be like, kind of do their own thing, and they won't kind of share, do that lateral learning that's so important in skiing. So we're all super stoked to have Ted here, and he's obviously still one of the fastest in the world. So I, I wouldn't say we're intimidated by him, but uh, we're definitely excited to see if, if we can hang with some of the fastest in the world still. I'm Ted Ligeti, I'm 35 years old, and I'm from Park City, Utah. I grew up skiing in Park City. Uh, my parents got me skiing when I was about two years old, and that was just kind of a natural thing to do when you're in Park City. The mountain, you know, Deer Valley is super close to my house, and just went there every day, and then started ski racing when I was about 10 years old. I just was like, had a group of friends that were all skiing together every day. My parents always joked the mountain was our, was our babysitter, so they'd drop us off and we'd just go skiing all day long. And then uh, a couple of them started getting into ski racing, so I just kind of followed them onto the Park City ski team and, and fell in love with it immediately. As a junior, I was actually not anywhere close to being any of the, the best guys on my, even like my local ski team. For people my age, I was like the fourth or fifth best kid. Can't be in races by like seven or eight seconds, but I just loved it. I love going fast. I love trying to figure out how to go faster. Um, in Park City, we had the World Cup every year, so I was really inspired by watching the best guys every year ski down my home hill. And then, you know, it wasn't until I was just about done with high school that I started to like make those big steps forward and then made the US ski team the year after high school and then just immediately like jumped up, started doing really well in the Norams. And so it was like really like a slow build and then like big hockey stick jump up at the very end. So just a lot of like perseverance and just loving the sport and that's kind of what stuck it in there for me. And so I made the U.S. ski team when I was 19 years old, and I was primarily a slalom skier at that point. And my first race on the U.S. ski team was actually a World Cup, so started racing World Cup right away. And you know, that first year was just like a whirlwind of you know figuring out the whole World Cup, and ended up scoring points at the end of the year in slalom. And then the next year I had another great year, and coming into the 2006 Olympics, I started skiing a little bit more GS as well, and ended up winning an Olympic gold medal in 2006. And all of a sudden, you know had no expectations of that and it was a dream come true and then won the following World Cup GS right after that and then, you know, been going ever since. So that's kind of like when I first like really arrived on the World Cup, I guess, is, you know, I was 21 years old in 2006 at the Olympics. So as being a 35 year old, I'm one of the oldest guys on tour now. I think I've had some of the most World Cup starts of anybody else on tour and I also have a family. I have a two year old son and wife and so, this year, I just decided to focus mostly on the giant slalom side of things. I'm doing a handful of Super Gs here and there, and then incorporating the World Pro Tour as well. So this year, it's really focusing in on just one event, trying to you know, get back to a good level there. The last few years have been tough with you know, a bunch of back injuries. A few years ago, I tore my ACL, then I had back surgery, and so a bunch of things over the last few years have kind of like slowed me down a little bit, but now I actually feel healthy again and feel like I'm getting back to a place where I can be one of the top guys in the World Cup. And, this year, just trying to like manage that schedule between World Cup and coming back home and spending time with the family, and so far it's been great. It's been a it's been a fun experience. I mean, his nickname is Mr. GS for a reason. He's got so much flow, so much strength, and if you watch his skis, they're just so clean. He's never spraying up snow or anything like that. So many of the things that make him great at GS, though, might not be the best for panel slalom because he does have a little bit of a loopier line, which is really good when you need to keep the energy flowing, but sometimes you just need to get aggro in panel slalom. You need to go a little straighter, you need to risk it a, a little bit more. So it'll be interesting to see how far he makes it through. There have been historically a lot of upsets in panel slalom, so only time will tell. Hopefully I'll be one of the ones who takes him out tonight. <laughs>
It's a little intimidating going up against Ted in this race, but he's gonna do the best he can on this short course, and there's not really a lot of space for him to get ahead, and there's also some good opportunities for him to mess up, so I think we all have some good odds just because of this is a unique format. I know a lot of these guys have been doing them for the last couple years, and so they've you know honed in on the format and, and know how to how to race and start gates and the jumps and all those pieces are are pretty new to me. So I'm gonna have to be a quick learning curve for me, hopefully. And so, you know, I think it's gonna be stiff competition. I don't expect to come in here and just like walk all over these guys because you know we have some guys that have had a lot of good World Cup experience, so it's not like these guys are just slouches. It's uh it's real competition. So, you know, I don't expect it to be easy. Here is a place situated off the map of ordinary, a place that is independent, free-spirited, and intimate in scale. A place that since its first lift was installed over 60 years ago, has strived to stay true to its roots while growing better rather than bigger. This vision for the future has helped make us the first ski resort in the world to earn B Corp certification. It's a symbol of where we're headed and what we stand for. We hope you will join us. Him and Jonah, so you're their uh, mentor, you're their team captain. Yeah. Yeah, so we're about to start the, the junior race. Uh, World Coast Skier Tour has been doing a junior section to add on with the uh, with the pros. Uh, so we're up here, we're gonna help the, the younger guys kind of inspect down the course, show them over the jumps and stuff, and get them fired up and ready to go. You now we're out at, we're out here for the uh, Alpine Bank Junior Race. Uh, I've got Team One. We're gonna come up with a better team name on our way <laughs> through inspection, but we're gonna inspect with the kids. We're gonna give them some pointers, and, and then these guys are gonna go head to head against the other teams. And uh, giving away, I think, close to $5,000 in scholarship money. So, yeah, let's get that bacon. Let's bake that bread. What do the kids say these days? Get that bread. After the round of 32, we had the Alpine Bank Junior Race, where we had local kids teamed up with one of us. So I had, you know, it's called Team... Team Ankeny, but we named it Team Taco because we had some Mexican food lovers on the team. Oh, do we have a team name, by the way? Anyone got any ideas like the Steak anacondas tacos. or the tacos? Yeah, team Taco. Yes. Team, yeah, taco? Good. team Taco. We're going to put is. some salsa verde on this thing. I think the age range was anywhere from... I want to say like 10 to 16 years old or something like that. And it's really fun to get paired up with the juniors because I remember when some of the U.S. ski teamers or Austrian ski teamers would come to races in Minnesota and I would just get so fired up. And so without well, future races, there's no pro tour going forward. So if we're out there, you know, mixing it up with the kids, that's another reason why I love the pro tour. And um, I think that's really important. Come up. You want to just be like, blue course ready. Yep. Racer ready? Go! Yeah, yeah. I think right when he says racer ready, that's when you go back, okay? And then and then you're ready to go as soon as it drops. Blue course ready? Yep. Big powerful yup. Yep. Yeah. One, two, three, go! Sorry. Just make sure that you get about 60 to 70 percent of a turn done above, and then you pass the gate, and then you can release and move right into the next one. Down the fall line. Down the fall line. Yeah. I remember watching the World Pro Tour when I was a kid. Actually, I remember seeing you know Bernie Knaus and, and those guys, you know, winning all those races, and Eric Schlopey coming on, you know, going from World Cup to Pro Tour back to World Cup. It's a cool way to bring ski racing back to a serious level in the U.S and then also have a really good alternative to World Cup as well, and bring high-level skiing around the U.S. to showcase that, I think is really fun. Are you gonna win tonight? I don't know, I hope so, but you never really know. It's, it's not so easy. Yeah, yeah different format, first duel, first pro race I've done, so. First couple runs, we're starting to figure it out, I think, so we'll see.
watching these kids come down the course and talking with them. It's it's always fun. I remember her being that age and, and watching, you know, some of the best guys in the world ski and, you know, chat with them. So it's cool to be here and be able to watch them ski and do that thing. Challenge. It was an amazing event. We had uh, Michael Ankeny's team here in second place, and Robert Cohn here, the winners, the champions today, and of course the famous Moose Barrows, the namesake of today's uh, competition. Not only the pro race, but also the junior race. Robert, you know you won the last two races. You got the winning team. You got an exciting uh, event coming up yet tonight. So uh, thanks for all you do and uh, for mentoring these children. And Michael, thank you as well because uh, without you guys, we couldn't pull this off. Came down to the wire. Team Ankeny, also AKA uh, Team Taco, ended up falling to Team Robert Cohn uh, in the finals. But Alpine Bank was gracious enough that they gave some prize money to the kids. So now they can set up youth savings accounts and, you know, my dad would have been stoked back in the day, like, oh, hey, now we, now you can go uh, ski in the summer out in Oregon or something like that. And now let's uh, let's bring up the checks. $4,800 total awarded, thanks to Alpine Bank. And uh, it's for uh, scholarship money for these kids and uh, securing their future and their education. So thank you all very much for being here. It was a great event. Congratulations to everyone. If you think a tin shed can hold up like a tough shed, you're in for a big surprise. After 38 years, our buildings speak for themselves. Dream, design, and build at toughshed.com. I got into ski racing probably around the age of six, seven, eight, and it, it was because I was just skied a lot at Killington, and uh, once people start telling you you're, you're pretty good and pretty fast at something, you, you try racing, and then once you're all right at racing and people keep telling you that, you, you stick with it. So started around age six, seven, eight, and then it just kind of grew from there and hasn't really slowed down. I definitely loved skiing and ski racing, and then as soon as I started to get get pretty good and, and people would tell me I was good at ski racing. I sort of stuck with that and that was definitely in the middle school, high school age and, and that's when you sort of need to decide how much education and uh, time in school you want to pursue or how much time you want to have on the slopes and it's, it was definitely a balance. So that decision arose when I was middle school at high school age. I went to college at Middlebury right there in the center of Vermont and I was pretty good at ski racing and so uh, after a good hot year on the NCAA circuit I was nominated to the US ski team and so I spent three years traveling with with that team and was a, a, a junior had some really strong results at World Juniors and then once I became a senior still had some strong North American Cup races with the US ski team <laughs> Right now, I'm, either, I'm based in between Boston and Vermont, and when I am up in Vermont, I take the quickest lunch break to take two runs or go for a skin, or I do it early in the morning or late in the sunset. So that's really when I have fun, but coincidentally, that's when I do the most training for the World Pro Ski Tour and even the NORAM Cup right now. Anything is mileage on the skis, and it all, it all counts. Yeah, I enjoy the, the format, the dual format, and it's it's really challenging sometimes to stay focused. I think the first couple years I was racing it and someone would be uh, ahead of me 
on my left or right there in my peripheral, I would kind of abandon my tactics and do anything to gain some speed and kind of make dumb mistakes to, to catch up in the short term, but it wouldn't pay off lower down in the course or as we faced some of the terrain and jumps. So now I, it's, it's really evolved, but it's, uh, it's, there's tactics and, and thinking about having a racer there. Some of the guys cross block or double block, whatever they want to call it, and it's when they trim off line by being right up t tight next to the gate with their skis. As long as their skis make it around it, it's fine and legal or allowed, but their body then has to totally crush the panel or blow through the panel to continue. So sometimes, yes, you can shave some line by double blocking, uh, but sometimes it slows you down because your body's hung up on the panel. Skiing is just like, I think we're all just adrenaline junkies, right? It's cool because you're both working with gravity, but at the same time you're fighting it. Cause like, especially on this course up here with the fall away slope, it wants to pull you this way, but you need to go that way. So then you need to stack your body in a way, get the weight over the outside ski and make sure you're moving forward. You need to mechanically get over there, even though you naturally want to go that way. Skiing has so many variables, and you just try to control as many as possible to make your skiing simple and the solution simple. There's so much that you can play around with skiing. You can change your lift in your toe by one millimeter, and then all your pressure goes on the tip of your tail, or you raise your heel and it goes onto the tail of your ski. And then you can change what angle your boots are at just by a half degree, and it's a world of difference. So my kind of analytical brain kind of likes that, to be like, okay, if I change this, what's the result gonna be with my skiing? And then to feel it and to see it also with video is, I think, is a, is a really cool aspect. It is a blessing and it is a curse. Uh, I would get what my old coach used to call paralysis through overanalysis, where sometimes you just gotta like let go. Let your mind just like clear the mind and just go. Cause you know, the fastest line is the one of shortest distance. And so if you're continually just like thinking and you almost get like robotronic and then it, it's, it's not as fast. So you kind of have to be like, okay, I'm gonna be like, really smart in this section of the course where I need to, you know, make sure that I have a nice high line so that I'm not getting low and late and putting on the brakes before the flat or, hey, here, just like, just go. Just, uh, just clear the mind, set it and forget it. So if you get your weight too far back, you're gonna go into like a wheelie. So you'll essentially just go out the back and then do a bit of a flat spin. Um, for the Pro Tour, if you go off the jump at all with a, a, a loaded ski with it bent, all that energy that's being built is just gonna explode and then you'll get released off the jump. So it's super important to go over the jump with a flat ski, absorb it, and then continue to turn. You kind of just have to, you know, you go down and you have to say, okay, what happened? That was my fault probably. How do I fix that? Get back into the gate. Hopefully you're not too rattled. Um, and then just try to execute. Good evening out here getting started and checking out that the surface is uh, setting up and being something good to push on. So I'm actually pretty used to skiing under the lights because at Buck Hill, I only trained at night until I was 16 years old. You get done with school, drive to the hill. The only thing is the vision, right? You don't really have shadows to give you contrast on the snow. You have to change your goggle lenses, all that stuff. It's really no different though. A little colder, but you know, the snow is the same, your competitors are the same, so you just gotta kinda roll with it and giddy up. Right next to me, 
The man that needs no introduction here is Chico Musa. Great pleasure to see Broski races back there in Howlson. No move. Well, Ken, it's always fun to come to Howlson. You know, these guys will all find out. 70 years ago, I started here, and there's still magic here. The namesake of the trophy is is after Moose Burrows. And I was talking to him earlier today, and he was talking about when the Pro Tour first started coming around. Back then, they had to keep amateur status, so you couldn't make money as a ski racer if you wanted to compete in the Olympics. And so that's kind of the origin story of the Pro Tour, is it was, it was a bunch of people who was like, hey, like I've perfected this craft. I deserve to make some money doing it. To have him here watching us, it's just come full circle. It's pretty cool, and it's pretty special to hear some of his stories that he had while he was competing, kind of comparing and contrasting to how the tour is set up now. And just to have legends like him and Billy Kidd down here watching, you know, giving us some advice, giving us some pointers here or there, and it's super special. I know Rob Cohen was super stoked to have his name engraved on Pepe's trophy from Vail, and so to kind of have that intergenerational connection is is really a cool aspect of the tour as well. Okay, it's time to go. Let's make it happen. When you're up at the start, you're usually out of breath and tired because you've been You've taken a dozen runs already uh, in the course or for warm-ups, so uh, once the racing action gets going, it's, it's rapid fire, so you're out of breath and that's, you're sort of focused on that rather than you know, any other nerves, or at least that's been what's working for me. So you're up top and just trying to do your best to bring the energy and then soon you're in the gate. Uh, you want to focus on when the gate will drop and it's a drag race. The beeps and the light goes, the gate drops and you want to have a good force of momentum to get you going for the first couple gates so you can start your turns and get the energy going into the course. And you want to just focus on your run even if the guy's ahead of you or behind you. And then just keep it forward through the first jump and keep your elevation through the rest of the course and clean to the finish. Generally, like the five, 10 minutes before I go out of the start gate, I kind of go through the course in my mind and think about the approach and what I need to do. And then, you know, as, a, as I'm warming up and then when I'm actually in the start gate, it's all about just trying to like focus on going and getting your mind out of the way and just like boom, 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 just like hammer down the course and not worrying about your skiing too much. You know, all that stuff should be ingrained from training all those days and just kind of have like go on instinct and you have, you've already had the game plan in your mind enough times that you know, you know where to go when you're going over the blind terrain and, and know what to, you need to do at certain sections, but you just try not to think about it when you're going the, down the hill, you're just trying to, trying to go faster. Yeah, this course here in Hollison Hill is tough. It's, uh, it's not easy, it's steep the whole way. There's actually a dog leg in it, which definitely plays into a complication of how you really approach that and both courses and there's some side hill, there's different terrain. So it's not just straightforward. You have to be smart about how you ski down and avoid the big mistakes. And it's gonna be interesting. I mean, the jumps are really big and you can't even see the next gate as you go over the jump. So having your direction really dialed in is really important. And then, you know, knowing the spots where you can take a lot of speed, but also knowing the couple sections we have to set up is important. So, you know, there's some definitely some key sections, you know, coming into and out of the jumps or especially the first jump is really important to be able to maintain that and then as you go through over the last jump it's just run and gun to the bottom. We got Simone Breitfuss Kamalander taking on Mr. GS Ted Ligeti in his first World Pro Ski Tour race and Simone pushing the needle here as he tries to stay ahead of Ted Ligeti going over that first jump and he continues to hold on to that lead. Ted Ligeti, the way he angles his skis and his ankles, gets his tush down on the snow, but it's not quite enough as they go over that second jump. Simone holding on to that lead as they come through the finish in that first run, he takes the heat. Yeah, this is the learning curve right there, is trying to figure out the start and just, you know, manipulate this course and try to get down there as fast as possible. And uh, definitely need to figure some things out for sure, but start is really, uh, this is my nemesis in the second. <laughs> Point two, it's nothing, especially now on the red course. It's easy, I have to send it. It's gonna be a fight. 
And here's Mr. GS, and there's so much energy and excitement surrounding Ted Ligeti and him being a part of the second stop on the World Pro Ski Tour. Ligeti charging hard on the top, throwing down some sweet arcs. Snakes by Kamalander, building speed with every turn. And Simone, he is the Bolivian bomber. What a machine he is. Smooth, cat-like off the jump. Ligeti coming into the finish and comes across the line with a win. Ligeti makes the semifinals in his first appearance at the new World Pro Ski Tour. That was close enough, but next time. The first one was good. Um, yeah, just trying to like not make too many mistakes and keep it safe and still going for it, so. You know, I made it through. There was definitely some troubles on the on the blue course, so made it through safely so far. Here is a place situated off the map of ordinary, a place that is independent, free-spirited, and intimate in scale. A place that, since its first lift was installed over 60 years ago, has strived to stay true to its roots while growing better rather than bigger. This vision for the future has helped make us the first ski resort in the world to earn B Corp certification. It's a symbol of where we're headed and what we stand for. We hope you will join us. Incredibly tight racing from both of you athletes. What is it going to take to get that job done, and how is the course holding up? I'll go first because I know what you're going to say, and I want to steal from you. Just consistency. You got to be solid. Two runs each course brings a different element to it. I think the red's got a little more rut in it. The blue's got a little more speed, so you got to be the master of both. Sorry, Garrett. Yeah, I think it's just it's all up to uh, how you handle the pitch, how you handle the landings off the jumps. Uh, it's really important to nail that starts as well. So I think if Michael doesn't choke out the start, we'll be all good. Yeah, redemption from Vale, you're going down. Maybe I should just not bring my skis again and use AJ's. Yeah. Or can I use yours next round? Next uh, round? Yeah, you know, I got, I got a pair of fours on today. Well, yeah, once I knock you out, though, I'll just take these. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, settle in. Be relaxed. Super relaxed. Zen. And then just miss your start. <laughs> Classic Driller trying to psych out Ankeny in the start. Ankeny gets the jump on Driller right out of the gate. Driller gets a little rough spot there, but Ankeny powering strong off the jump. Ankeny out in front still. Whoa! Driller gets in the back seat and inside and flips out of the course. Spectacular fall, but great recovery from Garrett Driller. I didn't know it was that much of a noodle. That looks a lot worse than it felt. Uh, so just uh, Michael got me at the start. I was pushing pretty hard to catch up to him. Went off the jump, went huge. And uh, back slap basically and just washed out, folded my body in half, felt like a pretzel and then got back up and kept skiing. But uh, max differential time, got to make up on this run to stay in the comp. So going for it still. Back at the top, it's Garrett Driller and Michael Ankeny. Garrett Driller going by the nickname the engineer, Michael Ankeny the Joker, with the max advantage of 0.7 on this run. But Ankeny knows Driller. He knows that he's the comeback kid. Driller is trying everything he can to catch Ankeny. Ankeny getting a little sloppy, a little wide. Sometimes inside, Driller coming on strong, reeling Ankeny back in. Driller is a machine, and he is making up time on Ankeny right now. And Driller comes across the line, 40 thousandths of a second. He takes it and moves on to the next round. So we're done now. Uh, yeah. now, it's time, now it's time to have a vodka soda. I was just trying to get in Mink's head. I was, uh, I was coming from behind. You know, you got to really push hard and just stay constant on the snow. And I was, uh, as soon as I hit the pitch, I just started yelling at him. I was just getting in his head. And I could just feel him just. Give it a little back to me. Give it a little back. And I finally got there at the very end. It was real close. This kid's yelling at me down the course. And I'm like, come on, dude. Give me a break. <laughs> He's yelling at me on the pitch. Going, come on, Mink. Come on, Mink. He was? Up at the start house now, we're going to see our semifinal first run between the defending champion right now, Robert Cohn. He's going to be taking over the red course. And Mr. GS himself. Ted Ligeti will be taking over the blue course. 
out of the gate at the same time. Both skiers really powerful up here on the top and neck and neck. Coming into this next jump, Ligeti touches down first and it's to the finish to the line, it's Ligeti. Mr. GS making a statement here tonight. Can he keep it up for the finals? Back to the top, Robert Cohn now has to make up a point four one nine against Ted Ligeti. They have swapped courses. Robert Cohn is on the blue course now. Ted Ligeti on the red. And these two boys are vying for a spot in the final round and they're out of the gate. Ted had the advantage, but Cohn's strong start. They went out at the same time. A point four one nine. He can make that up in no time flat. And that's all that Cohn needed to be able to take advantage of that point four one nine. Cone is two for two and on a mission to make it a three-peat. Throughout the day, it's really exciting to beat your opponent and to continue to the next round. And so after you cross the finish line, it's definitely some quick excitement that you, you beat the guy, but you really need to keep it moving to the next race and really focus on that rather than any short-term excitement. Yeah, I just got knocked out by Robert, and uh, that was a tough one for sure. I mean, he's got that start down, and you know I had a good advantage on him going in that last run and just lost it all right out of the out of the start before the first gate. And when you're on the right course and you start losing a deficit, it's hard to make it back up. So um, it was a battle and tried to tried to claw my way back in there, but uh, it wasn't in the cards. Phil Brown has the advantage going into this run. And he wants to win this race so badly after being knocked out in the round of eight a few weeks ago in Vail at the Pepe Gromsheimer Cup. And uh, he can taste the victory. But look what he's up against, Mark. Cone has won the last Red two pro ski tour Red events in a row. All right, it's time now for the race. We got Phil Brown on the red course, Robert Cohn on the blue course, both vying for $10,000. And the pressure is on. Brown is charging hard out of the start. Cohn, oh, gets a little bit forward and then off the jump, goes twisted in the wrong way. Brown strikes the gate and throws him off balance and he goes down. And Phil Brown is so lucky he didn't get injured. This year on the World Press Key Tour, I want to have a successful season by being consistent through these races, scoring some good points through all the standings, and uh, hopefully get, grabbing a couple wins, and hopefully it'll go well. We're about to present the first ever Moose Barrows Trophy here at Hallison Hill. Moose, will you do the honors? Robert, congratulations for winning the first Super Slalom at Hallison of many more to come. I'm thrilled to have this trophy here and really excited to see Moose. Uh, excited to see him every single run and bring the energy as I had a great day here. So this is just kind of a side project. You know, we got to give back to the people. Yeah. We give them back to communities. We, we give them back yeah. to the We got to let the jabronis win something. Yeah, exactly. Little. We don't want to be too good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everyone's out here going, did you see Nolan Casper up there? And they're like, yeah, I skied against him. And they, we just made their year. And it's only January 2nd, <laughs> and we made their year. That's crazy.